Welcome back to this specially extended edition of The World This Week with me, Phil Rees. Many of you, or at least the older ones amongst you, may remember that excruciating interview on American television when the then US Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, said sanctions on Saddam Hussein's Iraq was worth the deaths of half a million Iraqi children. Well, the European Union stepped up sanctions on Iran last month, leading to reports this week that the Iranian population is experiencing shortages of vital medicines and foods. The Iranian Charity Foundation for Special Diseases, a non-government organization that apparently supports six million patients in Iran, has complained about a serious lack of medicine to treat a number of diseases, including hemophilia and various forms of cancer. The charity says millions of lives are at risk. Here's Charlotte Hawkins. A display of Iran's military might. But could there be more going on behind the scenes? The International Atomic Energy Agency is tasked with monitoring Iran's nuclear program and has experienced only limited cooperation. We have requested access to Pachin. Uh, they uh, did not give us access, and uh, uh, they are doing uh, quite. A, uh, they are undertaking quite uh, intensive activities at, at the part at Pachin. This has reinforced global suspicions that Iran is indeed developing an atomic bomb. In an attempt to halt Iran's uranium enrichment, sanctions were introduced by the UN in 2006. However, Iran's nuclear program has continued to grow. Talks have been taking place on the issue between Iran and six major powers. But negotiations have been unproductive from a Western point of view, as Iran insists it is only developing nuclear power for peaceful purposes. Peaceful use of nuclear energy is Iran's right, but developing nuclear arms would violate international law. While negotiations continue, Israel is growing increasingly uneasy about the possibility of a nuclear-armed Iran. Given President Ahmadinejad's comments in 2005 that he wants to see the collapse of Israel. I think that we've witnessed a lot of attempts by Iran to earn more time in order to develop even further their nuclear ability, and I sincerely hope that the world will think about strict sanctions and not another round of uh, fruitless negotiations. The EU increased sanctions a month ago. The measures strengthen the sanctions which were already in place and have made even legitimate trade with Iran more difficult. The sanctions are alleged to have dramatically reduced Iran's oil sales and the value of the Iranian rail has dropped by almost half this year. UK politicians have reiterated their support for the sanctions. Iran is not just a threat to Israel, it is a threat to the world. Now there are some who say nothing will work and that we have to learn to live with a nuclear-armed Iran. I say we don't and we shouldn't. But at the same time, I also refuse to give in to those who say the current policy is fatally flawed and that we have no choice but military action. A negotiated settlement does remain within Iran's grasp. But until they change course, we have a strategy of ever tougher sanctions. The sanctions are designed to harm Iran's economy and force the country's leaders to abandon their nuclear plans. However, sanctions have been criticised for the effect that they are having on the general population, seen here protesting against the currency nosedive. They are preventing the import of some medications, and Iran state media reported yesterday that a 15-year-old boy has died in hospital due to a shortage of medicine. The Iranian population is also experiencing shortages of certain foods and drastic inflation of food prices. A foreign office spokesperson said, We've been clear that financial sanctions against Iran are not intended to affect humanitarian goods and payments. That's why the UK argued for and secured specific exemptions to allow humanitarian transactions to take place. Whilst it is true that sanctions are having an impact on the Iranian population, this is compounded by the Iranian government's economic mismanagement. 
Iran's leaders are responsible for any impact on their people and can make their choices which would bring sanctions to an end. Despite the increase in sanctions, the IAEA is expected to announce tomorrow that Iran's nuclear program has not slowed. If sanctions and negotiations do not succeed in limiting Iran's uranium enrichment program, other countries will have to choose between accepting the possibility of a nuclear-armed Iran or military intervention. Charlotte Hawkins, Islam Channel. Thank you, Charlotte. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined today by Lady Olga Maitland, the president of the Defence and Security Forum and for former influential conservative politician. I'm sure she still has influence. We also have Tom Watson from the Stop the Bomb movement. And finally, we hope to have, and uh, I say, and finally, he may not turn up, Professor Abbas Atalat, the founder of the Campaign Against Sanctions and Military Intervention in Iran. He's apparently on his way here, but uh, let's see if he can make it. Uh, meanwhile, Lady Olga Maitland, let me start with you. Um, we've heard these claims that, you know, certainly many children are at risk. Um, what do you think about the sanctions policy? I mean, does it work? It did not work in terms of Saddam Hussein. I mean, it certainly damaged his people and half a million children died, but he had to be toppled by military force in the end. So are they worth it? Well, in fact, my view is, is that they did really work. Um, people have done studies about the efficacy of uh, sanctions across the world, whether we're talking about South Africa or all sorts of different countries. And in the end, I do agree with David Cameron, actually, we do need to have a negotiated position. Now, the question is, how do you get to no, that? but he's because, saying more sanctions, so he's saying continuous uh, sanctions. Wait a minute, you interrupted me. The thing is, if you're going to get to a negotiation, you must actually have a window of discussion. The, there is no evidence whatsoever that these sanctions are pushing the leadership in Iran to a more amenable position. All that is happening, as you've seen very graphically in that television program, is that ordinary people have suffered. It's always the case throughout the world. So what we're really trying to say is how do we actually get to the kind of the heart, as it were, of decision making and have a conversation with these people in an unthreatening situation. Now, I took heart the other day when I read a report that the deputy F Russian foreign minister was uh, gave a complete go ahead for the Americans to meet face to face with the Iranians rather than going through go-betweens. Now, that's a good start. If Obama really pushes that on, I do think actually genuine conversations will be helpful. However, we have to look at the historical position. The, it is, you know, this is a very powerful and big country. It's the biggest country in that region. It's certainly the richest one after Saudi Arabia. And they see themselves being threatened by all sorts of nuclear powers, whether it's Israel, who, by the way, have not signed up to the non-nuclear pro pro proliferation treaty, whereas Iran has, whether it's Russia, whether it's Pakistan, whether sure. it's India. So they feel threatened. What we've got to do is to find a kind of an open space forum to have a real discussion, not just on our terms, but also on their terms. And yeah. I do believe that this is what we ought to be doing, and I hope that's what we're going to say in 2013. I mean, Tom, Tom Wilson, I mean, it's certainly true what she's saying about sanctions, isn't it? Um, I mean, what, what, you know, they don't seem to be working in terms of the leadership, um, even if you accept that there should be an attempt, and we'll come to the question of a, a nuclear bomb or whether, in fact, Iran is trying to make a nuclear bomb afterwards. But, I mean, sanctions themselves affect the people that I don't think anybody would wish to affect. No, I don't think anyone does. And I think that the measures that are taken should be um, aimed as much as possible at the leadership. Um, I also agree that negotiations would be the ideal avenue to go down, but I think... But you want more sanctions? Uh, yes, because I think that for negotiations to work, there needs to be pressure in Iran mm. to actually make um, Iran take part in these negotiations seriously. We have had some talks which Baroness Ashton, of course, has taken part in, and it seems mostly that they sort of discuss where the next meeting is going to take place and what will be on the agenda. They don't really get down to any serious discussions. Um, and, of course, we had back in 2006 when the Defence Minister of Germany offered Iran uh, a way out of sanctions, essentially, by saying that um, the UN could oversee uh, peaceful nuclear um, testing for, for energy purposes. And Iran walked away from that. They didn't take up that offer. So, in a sense, Iran oh. have chosen sanctions. Okay, so, so how many children would you say, as a Madwin Albright, as we've heard earlier, said that half a million children dying in Iraq was worth it. How many 
dead children do you think would be worth it to try to, to, bring, to bring Iran to the negotiating table? Well, I'm not going to give you a number, but what I will say about the extent to which civilians suffer is I think that as much as sanctions clearly do hurt the population, a lot less people get hurt than if there was some kind of nuclear conflict in the Middle East. That would be the worst possible scenario. And if, if sanctions are a way of avoiding that, then I, I still feel that those are preferable. So do you think Iran is a, is a threat to, to, to the... I mean, who, you know, we heard David Cameron saying it's a threat to the world. Well, I mean, Iran's military expenditure is about $8 billion a year, as opposed to 650 by the United States. So who exactly is Iran threatening, by the way? I mean, not us in Britain. Oh, definitely Britain as well. Britain I mean, is they've, under threat from Iran. It was for sure. They, I mean, they've tested missiles which have reached uh, mainland Europe. But our troops have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan by Iranian-made roadside bombs. And don't forget, they also stormed the British embassy in Tehran, and they kidnapped um, three na British naval personnel in 2007. So I think they clearly are a threat to British interests in the area as well. Well, Britain is very close to them, though, isn't it? I mean, they're not very close to Britain, I don't think. But, I mean, anyway, we'll let, we, we, we've gone with that. We're very pleased that Professor Abbas Atalat has joined us. Uh, thank you. I know you got stuck on the tube. Um, now, I mean, we've just been discussing the efficacy of sanctions so far. Um, I mean, you clearly oppose them. Um, I mean, but... You know, let's put to one side concerns in the West about Iranian expansionist or, or other policies. Um, I mean, what would you say about the sanctions themselves? Well, first of all, those concerns are, ju are just a pretext for a regime change in Iran in the same way that we saw a criminal illegal war against Iraq, which led to a regime change. So those concerns are just um, completely unfounded. Uh, there is a fatwa in Iran against the production, stockpiling and use of uh, not just nuclear weapons, but all weapons of mass destruction. When, with the support of the British, German, Dutch and American companies, with the complicity of their governments, the Saddam regime used chemical weapons against Iranian population, Iranian soldiers. Iran did have the capacity to build uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons, but because of a fatwa by the then leader of the Islamic revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, it refused to do so on moral grounds. So we have a moral issue here. The Islamic Republic's track record shows that it's not developing weapons of mass destruction, although it has been the victim of weapons of mass destruction supported by the West against Iran. Yes, so those concerns are completely unfounded. Uh, what your um, previous guest has said is exactly the same scenario that those war criminals who led us to the destruction of Iraq now want to do exactly the same with the same scenario, same scenario, same people, same war crime. Mm, parallel. Well, we'll come to Tom, perhaps it will in a minute that would, would answer that, but um, La Lady Olga Maitland, I mean, you know, would you, I mean, uh, would you accept, though, that Iran is not actually a very aggressive country, or do you think it is? Because it hasn't invaded any of its neighbors in recent history. I mean, for example, unlike another country that's bombing um, Palestine today, the state of Israel. So uh, well, uh, do you think there's a fair understanding of Iran, or is Iran the threat that Tom Wilson suggests because of uh, you know, various activities in the embassy and this and that? I think actually the greatest threat that we get from Iran is not as Tom described, but because they support insurgencies in other countries. So they have been funding the Hezbollah. Now the Hezbollah have undoubtedly been attacking and supporting, uh, well, attacking Israel, and successfully, I have to say, but it's not what we would desire. And indeed, they have been supporting uh, Assad, President Assad, in uh, Syria to a big degree. So there's no doubt about it. They're not entirely innocent. And, you know, we need to look at Iran with clear eyes. But put that to one side. There is, over history, there is no occasion that we can think of that Iran has actually invaded another country and occupied it and annexed it. Now, I must say, Israel certainly has. I mean, they've, they've taken over the territory well, from Syria, from Jordan, from uh, Egypt. So oh, the West and Syrian occupiers as so well. Don't so don't let's uh, go into a complete kind of blame game about this. But do, we, do I regard Iran as a threat? Apart from the fact that they are dangerous because they've been supporting these insurgents, which I think is something we have a case about, in terms of whether they will or whether they won't have nuclear weapons, my biggest concern is this. Actually, I think at the end of the day, probably will get it. 
I think that unless the West have a proper accommodation and a working relationship, they will push them down that road. Secondly, the real issue, surely, is not does a country have a nuclear weapon, but is a country responsible about how they handle it and what they do? The world is full of nuclear weapons, regrettably, and not of them, and many of them are not at all stable, like Pakistan. Mm. And I do think there are some very serious issues. So I take the position it well, is better to have a proper working relationship with Iran, not excluding them, but bring them close well, you know, to your certainly, chest. Certainly, Lady Olga, thank you. I mean, let's put that to, to, to you know, Tom Wilson. I mean, what, what Iran is asked for is a comprehensive non-proliferation talks in the Middle East to actually get rid of all nuclear weapons in the Middle East. But that actually includes Israel, which is a non-signatory, of course, of the international body um, and is reputed, certainly according to Mr. Venunu, of having around 200 nuclear warheads. Well, I mean, surely Iran is talking sense there. Well, I think that you make a good point in that Israel isn't signed up to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and so it's not certainly not breaking that, whereas Iran is. Iran is committed not to develop nuclear weapons, and yet it appears that that is what's happening. Well, it appears. I, I, well, well, I think well, what evidence have you got for that? Because, uh, I mean, the CIA now says, and it said it repeatedly in 200, 2007, a report by the CIA, the National Intelligence Estimate, concluded with high confidence that in 2003 Iran halted its nuclear weapons. Even just last year, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence said we continue to assess that Iran is keeping open the option, but at the moment, doesn't have that bomb now. I mean, you know, this is this is not this is not press TV or this is the Central Intelligence Agency. So why do people think it is actually got a bomb? Well, probably because the um, International um, Atomic Energy Agency has um, released numerous reports saying that it does, and that the UN Security Council thinks that it does. We know that it um, has the designs for a trigger for a nuclear bomb, and we also know that Iranian officials were in North Korea during the testing of nuclear weapons. I don't think you could square that with a peaceful. Um, um, energy project. But, you know, the trigger, the trigger, the evidence of that, a lot of it came from Mossad, is uh, my understanding, certainly evidence that Times produced. But, I mean, let's put that to, uh, I mean, you know, most of the Western newspapers, and indeed, you know, Tommy reports, reports that Iran does have a bomb. I mean, some people might say, well, why shouldn't it, given what we've heard from Lady, Lady Olga Maitland, that, you know, there are 200 nuclear weaponry in, in Israel, which is um, you know, sworn enemy, as it were. So why shouldn't it go for one? Well, because there's a fatwa there against the production. A stop religious fatwa. A religious fatwa, yeah. yes, by the supreme leader. Mm. And um, as I said, during the Iran-Iraq war, they could have uh, retaliated against the chemical attacks by Saddam with um, their own chemical weapons. And they didn't. They didn't produce chemical weapons. So there's a track record, very clear, unlike Israel, which has been using weapons of mass destruction routinely against the Palestinian population and the Arab population, Iran has never developed ke uh, chemical weapons or has never had any military studies even for nuclear weapons. Any evidence that has been alleged on Iran's nuclear... Well, it was a very thick IEA, uh, International Atomic Energy yes. Agency report, the, the, which we know about, but it was... What would you say about that report? Well, we can't go, you know, our audience into detail. Dr. El Baradi, the previous head of the agency, has repeatedly said that all th these allegations are completely without foundation. He refused to pu put those in the reports of the IAEA. The new head of the agency, of course, as the WikiLeaks documents have disclosed, got his position as the head of the agency only when he proved that he's in solid uh, solidarity with the United States against Iran. Only that was the guarantee that he got his job. So what the Western governments have done is to politicize uh, Iran's nuclear file and has used the head of the agency for, 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 for that aim. I mean, Tom Wilson, I mean, it's a fair point, isn't it, that the, the allegation of a, of a hypothetical bomb certainly isn't, isn't conclusive, uh, and that the reaction of the West is, is, is really quite disproportionate now, with leading to perhaps deaths of millions of children, that this is all because of some hypothetical bomb that may or may not be, 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 that be, be tested. 
First of all, I don't think it's hy just hypothetical, but even if it was, this isn't just the West. The UN Security Council has passed four different series of sanctions since 2006. Um, Japan and South Korea also feel the same way. So I think that there's a broad consensus. And Iran itself has committed not to develop a, a nuclear weapon, so it, it, the um, non-proliferation treaty. So I don't see how Iran can explain it's the research that we know has taken but place with that Iran commitment. Iran should suffer because it actually signed the non-proliferation treaty, whereas Israel, because it hadn't signed it, is free to do what it wants to. Nor is Pakistan and nor is India, by the way. Mm -hmm. But I agree. But if you enter into but an international... The sanctions on them for not signing it? Uh, well, for a start, because if you want to take Israel, for instance, it hasn't threatened to destroy any of its neighbours, whereas Iran has. And Ahmadinejad has stood in the UN and made his intentions towards wiping out um, Israel quite clear. He's also said similar things about America. He's said that a world without America isn't only possible, but also but these desirable. Are words, not actions. I mean, what? Uh, I mean, well, actually, I mean, these are just big lies. I mean, the big lie theory is that if you repeat a lie millions of times, then people start to say maybe there's something in it. In fact, if you really want to know about whether Ahmadinejad or any of the Iranian leaders has really threatened the state of Israel, you can Google the deputy prime minister of Israel, mm -hmm. right, uh, Dan uh, Meridor. Dan Meridor, if you Google him, the first item which comes, it says that we, we misquoted Ahmadinejad, that he never we threatened debates, Israel. We have debates about that quote. Listen, we could go on discussing this for a long time. I'm afraid we have run out of time. So big thank you to our guests here. And thank you for watching this specially extended edition of The World This Week with me, Phil Rees. Please join us again next week. Salam alaikum.